joining us. You know, today is George Harrison's 81st birthday. Huh? Happy birthday, George. All I can say is God bless George Harrison. I think I speak for everyone here up on stage, probably for a lot of you as well. We owe a lot to this great soul. Hey, you know what? Before we get into anything else, what do you say we get right into the music? Are you ready for some really good music? Yeah. You're, you're gonna love these guys. This is the most amazing. This is um, one of George's earliest recordings. It's off of the uh, uh, 1966 Revolver album. It's called I Want to Tell You, and it, it goes a little something like this. <laughs> show this year, and uh, I must say the room is utterly aglow with the, with the radiance and the talent of the irresistible Joe DeJesu. Thank you, Joe, for being with us here. Uh, the ferment of sound explodes tonight with the, the energy and just oozing out of our next artist. Would you join me please in welcoming Michael also. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it fills me with repelations of joy, <laughs> spasms of euphoria to, 
to introduce our fearless leader, the man, the man who puts sacred altar into altar caca, the, the man who redefines the term anachronism. Please join me in welcoming the one, the only, Godfrey Townsend. Thank you. I just have to tell you, everyone up here has built the most extraordinary career. Uh, Godfrey, I just I have to ask you this question. I mean, you've had this amazing run of, 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 of performances and, and successes. What, what was the original impetus for getting into such a grossly uh, low-paying and abusive <laughs> career for you? What was the... It wasn't my first choice, actually. No, it wasn't. What was your first I, choice? Um, I wanted to be the guy that gets shot out of the cannon. Really? <laughs> really? Why was that? Um, I thought it was going to be exciting, but uh, then I found out it was much harder than actually trying to become a successful musician because you only really get one shot. <laughs> okay, that's what you're going to expect this evening. Just be prepared. Um, let us not forget, where's, where's Greg Groove? Where's Greg? There he is. Ladies and gentlemen, our sound in here. Greg Oh, oh shit. I'm your impoverished host, Joshua Green. <laughs> author, thank you very much. Author of the um, quickly backlisted biography of George Harrison, Here Comes the Sun, reasonably priced at the book table at the back. Um, we performed this show, gosh, I think I, I counted 87 times so far. Oh, well, it's, it's actually only 27, but we're very optimistic. <laughs> Yeah, the response has been very good. Um, this is what the show usually looks like, but um, we had to scale it back because of uh, Brooklyn building codes. Um, my great fortune was to have a chance to record with George on the Radha Krishna Temple album back in 1970 in London with the Krishna devotees there at Apple Studios. And uh, I got to spend time with him at Friar Park, his home west of London. It was a rare privilege. And the bottom line is we do this show because we love George. We love his music, we love his dedication to Krishna, to spiritual practices. And my God, he showed that spiritual life could be fun. I mean, look at that smile. And look at how miserable everyone else is. <laughs> I mean, that's what you're gonna get this evening. Some lousy jokes, some personal reminiscences, some fantastic music, and the uh, story of an extraordinary human being. There will be a 15 minute intermission halfway through the show, so, Hold it. Um, <laughs> picture of George in India. We're also going to give you some George takeaways, because he was filled with wisdom. So uh, it was fitting, for example, that we started with, I want to tell you. He had stuff he wanted to tell us. A good opening number. What did he mean by beware of Maya? What did he mean by living in the material world? What did he mean by any of these great messages that he gave us? People didn't understand. So part of what we're doing is trying to clarify George's message. So another takeaway will be some little bits of George wisdom. Here's the first one. There's more to life than boogieing. Should we have fun in life? Yeah, of course we should. But don't neglect cultivating your inner life. So let's take a look briefly at the inner life of this beautiful human being and then go right back to the music. He was born on this day in 1943, the youngest of four children. Liverpool was still going through World War II and it had its fair share of bombing. So at, at birth, George Harrison would have been hearing the sounds of war. And if you want, you can track George Harrison's life from a progression of sound, from the wartime explosions of World War II to the peaceful sound of God's names, which is how he passed away in 2001. As a boy, he wanted to get away from that squalor of post-war Liverpool, and so motorbikes and later sports cars became a, a big theme in his life. Um, more important, he saw to get away through music. And um, like all kids in those days, dreamed of a career in rock and roll, inspired by artists of the day. Uh, and rock and roll was exciting. You know, it was, it was totally wild, totally obnoxious. And every kid in the 1950s wanted to be a part of that. So to give you a taste, of the rock and roll from those days. Here's a two-minute video of George Harrison playing um, 
this great song, he was 20 years old, this great song by the great rock uh, misogynist, Barry. <laughs> and if you feel like giving vent to your inner Ringo, we've, spent, we've set aside some space down here for dancing. And you are seriously encouraged to get up and dance over on the left side or the right side. Um, and um, here we go, you have two minutes to let loose. And I'm serious, put your stuff down and get up and start dancing, right? So here's George you know, playing a little rock and roll, right? Everyone's dancing. Store executive Brian Epstein loved their energy, became their manager. Appearances mattered, so as you can see here, he taught them not just how to behave like stars, but to dress like stars. Why don't we dress that way? I don't know, you guys are still practicing on that one. <laughs> Look at you, I, mean, I don't get it. All right. Um, so they got, and they got famous. They got real famous. I mean, how famous were they, you might ask? I'm glad you asked. What a crowd. Uh, here's, well, here's one example. On George's 21st birthday, he received more than 1 million letters, cards, and gifts. Seven truckloads of mail from the British Postal Service. And that was just from one fan. From one fan. And, um... Was it you? You raised your hand. <laughs> If you're, if you're too young to have been around when the Beatles... Is anyone old enough here to have actually attended a Beatles concert? I'm old enough, but I... Really? I can speak louder if you want me to. I can <laughs> I, I hear, I'm hearing it as well. I do. Uh, it's hard to describe how big they were, but imagine, for example, if you weren't around in those days, if Beyonce, Lady Gaga, Taylor Swift, and Katy Perry decided to form a boy band, you might get a little bit of a sense of how powerful the Beatles were in those days. But it started, you know, getting a little bit crowded. George was always kind of pushed to the back behind this uh, songwriting dynamo of Lennon and McCartney. But uh, one day when he was um, feeling sick in a hotel room, he started his own uh, career as a songwriter and came up with this little ditty. It's not a great song, but it, it reflects a little bit his growing uncertainty about the, um, the value of material uh, success. Boy, boys, the stage is yours. So go away. 
Ethnomusicologists began analyzing and deconstructing the Beatles' music with the following kind of academic gobbledygook. This is an excellent quote. Don't Bother Me mostly stays in a minor key, but with a Dorian alternation during the chorus that transforms the verse to an Aeolian mode, thus achieving a thick sound through an elaborate percussion that lends the song a Latin rhythm accentuated by a time stop structure. Well, they read that, and John's response was, yeah, we're going to go see a doctor about that one. <laughs> <laughs> then, um, this was when he was in that hotel room sick, you mentioned. Yes, yes, that, uh, that's, that's the only kind of frame of health you could have to write a song like that. Mm -hmm. um, then the big step was in February 1964. National U.S. television on the Ed Sullivan Show. 60 years, almost to the day. Uh, and it changed rock and roll history forever. 73 million people who watched that television broadcast of the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan Show. Now, remember, this was just three months after the Kennedy assassination. The nation was in a depression, right? The country was traumatized by that, by the Vietnam War, Cold War. And, um, and here were these guys having a great time, just riding above all of the sadness, and America rewarded them with riches beyond their wildest dreams. Now, the Beatles let Brian Epstein handle their finances, so they actually never had any idea whether they had any money or not. Um, take a look at their reactions in this collection of video clips from the early days of the Beatles. You're about to see scenes from their movie, A Hard Day's Night. You're gonna see girls fainting on the Ed Sullivan Show. And when the film goes to color, we're in Shea Stadium in 1964. 55,000 people, the largest single audience for any concert in history. Police were overwhelmed, and um, it was absolutely the top of the mountain of mix, uh, material success and stardom. Here, take a look at this. You were trying to actually spend this 
That's just in merchandise, not from the records, just from merchandise. The music yeah, just from one. That was one fan <laughs> who bought all that merchandise. Um, the music catalog today earns more money than it did 60 years ago when the Beatles were touring. I mean, it was a little crazy. You know, it's it turned a little sour. At first, it was silly. George made the mistake of telling journalists that he liked um, jelly beans. So <laughs> from then on, whenever the Beatles took to the, uh, to the stage, fans pelted them with, you know, thousands of these rock-hard little candies. I'd like to take this opportunity to let everyone know that Joshua really loves coconuts. <laughs> <laughs> Here's your next takeaway. Uh, be careful what you wish for. Uh, they had success, but it came at a very steep price. They had no private life whatsoever. I mean, fans would pop out from hotel closets for under their beds. You know. Then it got seriously dangerous. There were thousands who started charging their cars, the stage. People got killed. And, you know, the police had to fend off fans with clubs and with police dogs. Worse than the jelly beans. Worse than death threats. Worse than all of the losses of privacy in any kind of personal life. Worst of everything was the taxes. The British government took 70% of everything they earned. So, in retaliation on the 1966 album Revolver, George had one song that he wrote that reveals his frame of mind about the price of success and his growing discontent over life in the material world. And it sounds something like this. One, two, three, four. <laughs>
Joe DeJesu on the vocals. Michael also on the lead guitar. Okay, fun song but a bitter song because the lads were bitter and they were exhausted. Between 1961 and 1965, the Beatles performed more than 1,400 club dates, if you can imagine. Uh, George once said for every one year the Beatles put in, they put out 20 years of work. And by age 23, success had robbed George of the joy of living. Um, he had it all, and he had been a happy child. He loved goofing around, and the Beatles certainly had a good time. And, uh, there, but there had to be more. That was the point. There had to be more to life. George had this intuition uh, that there's more to George than the image of him in the media. I love, this is one of my favorite photos of George Harrison. You have to look at what he's doing. He's looking at his own effigy, his wax statue in Madame Tussauds Wax Museum. And George once said, sorry to disappoint you, but I'm not really Beatle George. That was a little part that got played in this life, but there's so much more. Well, that's another George bumper sticker right there. There's so much more. But where to go? Where to discover that so much more to life? <laughs> well, the first place uh, he went was by accident. His dentist spiked his coffee with LSD, <laughs> what he later called the dreaded lysergic, you know, lysergic acid, the dreaded lysergic. At first, um, it was an interesting way of seeing reality, but it quickly got boring. He visited San Francisco thinking maybe he'd go to the epicenter of the drug culture and he'd find something, creative people or whatever. Um, instead, it was just a bunch of strung out hippies. He was very disappointed. About drugs, he once commented that if you want to go higher, you've got to stop getting high. There's another good bumper sticker. So the next place he went to to find that something more to life was music. Friends turned him on to records uh, by Ravi Shankar. And he said that hearing Ravi Shankar's music sounded familiar. Eventually he met Ravi Shankar and was mesmerized by what Ravi told him. Ravi said, make the right music and you can bring God out of hiding. Make the right music and you can bring God out of hiding. That was the first time George had an, George had an intuition that his talents might have a, a higher purpose. Now, this is interesting. Um, I interviewed George's sister, Louise, and she mentioned to me that when their mo mother was pregnant with George, she used to listen on weekends to BBC radio, and there was a program called All India, and they played recordings that had been sent from Bombay of Ravi Shankar playing ragas and temple music. So whether he was remembering what he'd heard in his mother's womb or something from a previous life, we'll never know. But the music called to him. And then on the set of Help, which was the Beatles' second feature film in 1965, he saw a sitar on the set that musicians from India had brought. And he started noodling on the sitar. And Ravi suggested that if he really wanted to learn to play, they should visit India. And in 1966, they did go to India. They went to Kashmir. This is the actual houseboat where uh, George and Ravi stayed in India. And he, Ravi gave him books. And George started reading the only books that were available at that time about his mystic India, in particular, Autobiography of a Yogi by Paramhamsa Yogananda and Raja Yoga by Swami Vivekananda. Now, reading was a new thing for George. As a boy, as a student, he was never never much of a reader. Uh, he didn't like over-intellectualizing his life. It spoiled the fun. It's like, you know, coming down on Christmas Day and looking for your presents under the tree and then remembering you're Jewish. You know, <laughs> kind of spoils it to overthink it. But these books on, on yoga and on mysticism, they completely turned him on. And what did he discover? He discovered that he was an eternal being, different from his physical and that the peace that he sought was already within him. Right? That death is not the end. One door closes and another opens. And he expressed his understanding by saying, and here's your next George takeaway, 
The only reason to be alive is to realize our eternal self. Everything else is secondary. Now, that's pretty good for a 24-year-old. So he returned to England from India and attended a lecture by Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. And at that point, he wanted to share it. Well, if you've got a good thing, why don't you want to share it with your friends? And they brought the other Beatles to India on another trip. This was in summer of 68. To Maharishi's ashram in Rishikesh. And he arrived with friends. You see some of them here up on stage. Mia Farrow, Mia's sister Prudence of Dear Prudence fame. Mike Love of the Beach Boys, Donovan, Mr. Mellow Young. Take a look at this footage, another compilation, which includes scenes from those uh, days in uh, the Beatles in India. We do like the fans and enjoy reading the publicity about us, but from time to time you don't realize that it's actually about yourself. You see your pictures on them read articles about you know, George Harrison, Ringo Starr, Paul John, and, but you don't actually think, oh, that's me. Let me take you down, cause I'm coming to strawberry field. Nothing is real. It certainly showed me what was really happening in the drug cult. It wasn't what I thought of all these groovy people getting having spiritual awakenings and being autistic. At that point, I, I, I stopped taking it, actually, the, the dreaded my surgery. During the filming of Hell, there were some Indian musicians in a restaurant scene, and I kind of messed around with the sitar there. But during that year, towards the end of that year anyway, I kept hearing the name of Ravi Shankar. And when we were working on Norwegian Wood, it just needed something, you know, it just needed something. And it was quite spontaneous. I remember I just picked the sitar up and kind of found the notes. Well, that's a good segue into our next song. Uh, here's the sheet music for those of you who would like to uh, hum along. Godfrey Sunday's.
is incredible. Far from the noise and pace of city life in the cool, clear air of Rishikesh, North India, Kathy News reports from the meditation retreat of Maharishi Maharish Yogi, the man who, through transcendental meditation, is currently bringing peace of mind to the people. Pools of sorrow, waves of joy are drifting through my opened mind, possessing and caressing me. Now that's a happy guy. I mean, look at that photo. It's amazing. And uh, the time in, in Rishikesh was musically very productive. I mean, the Beatles wrote more songs in Rishikesh than at other, any other time in their career. More than 40 songs came out of the time they spent there in India. Most of them went into the White Album. Practically the entire White Album was in there. Much of the Abbey Road Album as well. Um, Godfrey, with, uh, wasn't Donovan teaching them some yes, um, guitar work? Yeah, you know, besides the other people you mentioned before, I think you mentioned Mike Love from the Beach Boys was over there at the yep. same time as them uh, on a retreat at the uh, Maharishi's ashram and uh, Mia Farrow, of course, and uh, so Donovan was also there in this picture. You see him there just kind of sitting around playing guitars. With him. And he showed, showed them this finger-picking technique of playing acoustic guitar. And what is astounding is that how easily they were able to just adapt it to things. And there's about a half dozen songs on the White Album that all have that cool finger picking style, and it just sounds like they've been doing it forever. You know? Just before you get into it, though, Joe, didn't you tell me uh, a Donovan story? Uh, yes. Um, <laughs> well, first of all, George is my favorite Beatle, and right, right from the beginning, always was. And um, in 2003, somebody told me about this thing called the Fest for Beatle Fans, so I decided to go by myself. And my first night there, I happened to meet my future wife, who I now have two children with. And the first night that I met her, we jammed with Donovan. He was a special guest, and he just came and sat next to us. Like that picture. Like, I, I mean, it's strange, because I happen to have a picture <laughs> there it is. of that. Oh, yeah. you know, it just <laughs> happens to be there. I'm showing me the picture. Yeah, there, 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 there it is right there. There you are. It's me and my wife looking at each other's eyes right there. First day we met. <laughs> so, so this next song, um, it, it's a wonderful song. It explores the emotions of birds. Yes, birds also have emotion, emotions. They're called foul moods. And, oh, come on. You pay, my, aren't you my pay jokes your money. better than his? Mine are you know, way better than his. We set up here. We'll take your chances. I'm, you know. Okay, you ready? I'll take a vote. You want to do this? All right, yeah. All right, please, we're serious. Blackbird singing in the dead of night. Take these broken wings and learn to fly all your life. You were only waiting for this moment to arrive. Blackbird singing in the dead of night Take these sunken eyes and learn to see All your life You were only waiting for this moment to be free Blackbird fly Into the light of the dark light of the night. 
I've been singing in the dead of night. Take these broken wings and learn to fly all your life. You were only waiting for this moment to arise. You were only waiting for this moment to arise. You were only waiting for this moment to arise. We're going to have an intermission right after this next song. I dare you to guess what the song is. Uh, this, uh, <laughs> this is also from the, uh, the White Album. One of the most beloved of George's compositions. This is still early in his spiritual journey. And so it's a sort of, it's kind of a forlorn observation of the state of the world. You'll see in the second half of the show how that perspective on the world changes in a very, very wonderful way. Oh, sorry. <laughs> you make noises when you move around when you get off. I just pulled my back. That's, a, that's quite a guitar. Good shot. Yeah, where'd you get that? Uh, from my dentist. Off we go, lads. Uh, back in the days when it was fun to go to the dentist. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, sure, yeah. Uh, before we do it, um, you know, this was one of those times when the Beatles were kind of maybe not getting along so well and getting tired of each other or seeing too much of each other. And um, uh, George was good friends with Eric Clapton. And um, he invited him down to the studio to play guitar on a, on a specific song that George wrote for the album. And the reason why he figured it would be cool is that, is that if Eric came into the studio, maybe the other fellows would behave a little better with a guest there or something, kind of like he did with Billy Preston later on. Um, and and um, unheard of to have another and they, guest on yeah. the song. Right? And they just went for a ride. Uh, George took him for a ride in his car, and he said, hey, why don't you come down to the studio and play on this song? And, and uh, Eric said, I don't even have a guitar. Hmm. And he said, I have a friend of yours down at the studio for you to play an old friend of yours. And it turned out it was a red Les Paul that uh, Eric had bought for George as a gift uh, a few years earlier and gave it to George. Uh, and George named it Lucy because it was finished in a cherry red finish. So he liked Lucille Ball and so he <laughs> named the guitar Lucy because of the cherry red finish on the, on the finish. And that's the guitar that, that uh, Eric played on that track actually. So. And we have it here today. <laughs> no. It was actually on stage at Bangladesh. If you look at the videos from Bangladesh, Lucy is on stage at Bangladesh. He's on and the stage he, with Eric. And he used this big Lucy, fat jazz Lucy. guitar. <laughs> right. He loved the tone. That's what drugs do to you. <laughs> Yeah. 
a year we were doing it with like 30 musicians. Uh, a lot of these musicians have been on stage with us doing that as well. And a tradition that I kind of started in the very beginning of it was I used to bring this uh, Indian milk sweets that are offered on the altar to the deities and become spiritualized. So it's called prashadam, which just means the Lord's mercy. So we can eat these sweets and we become spiritualized. And there's no drugs in it, so don't worry. Happy <laughs> So, um, so we've got a plate full right up here, and if you want to come on up and uh, just help yourself and take a piece and taste it or whatever, uh, and they're just there. For there's you. also yeah. concession tables in the dining area, book table in the back. See you in 15 minutes. Thank you. Loved going to India. Here he is with some of his devoted friends. On the far right is Mukunda Swami. And all, both of these people I knew when I was a lad in the London Temple in 1970. Next to him in the middle is Shamasundar, who um, wrote an extraordinary memoir of his years with George and with uh, our teacher Prabhupada called. Chasing Rhinos with the Swami. I recommend it to you. 
It's a wonderful book. He went, George went to India many times. Um, here he is in India disguised as Christopher Walken in the deer. <laughs> So, just want to make a little uh, point here about something. So, these two devotees that are in the picture with George, right here, this is like in what, 2000, the year 2000, or a little earlier? Maybe a little earlier. Uh, but those are the two devotees that you see in the Get Back movie, sitting at, in the studio with the Beatles uh, back in 1969, 70, whatever that was. Uh, that's when George first met them. And here it is 30 years later, and they were still very good friends and, and associated together a lot. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He, never, he never stopped. Whatever happened, he always kept his... As a matter of fact, you brought Shamasundra to one of my shows, right? right oh, I did here indeed. On Long Island. I did indeed. That was exactly. me who did that. Yeah, that was me. Right. Uh, here he is, Shamasundra. This, this is earlier. This is around 1970 wow. when they first yeah. met. And then um, George spent time with... Swami uh, Bhaktivedanta Prabhupada, founder of the Krishna movement. And um, he did, George took his practices very seriously. Here you see him on the left chanting on a, a rosary called a Japa Mala, beads for chanting the Krishna mantra. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. And the other photo is a small altar that he built in his, uh, in the um, temple room of his home in uh, Friar Park, west of London. You can see it's a very modest affair. He had no uh, alter ego. Oh, come on. You set up. You know. they're, they're keeping score, don't worry. Right. Um, I think everything George did. This is Mukunda talking about George. Some very interesting insights here. I think you'll like this. Even Get a little sound something. up. That, that is, is considered a, one of the greatest love songs ever written. Can you guys hear this? Not just that. Can, can be seen as a love song to God. I think what the thing about the, the music that makes it spiritual is, is the person who is singing it, namely George, that he, he wanted to be spiritual, he had a spiritual dimension to him, he was known to be involved in spirituality. Mantra, as we no, in English means some some phrase that's repeated again and again. Actually, mantra is a Sanskrit word. Originally, it meant a sacred chant to and, and this maha mantra. Maha means great in Sanskrit. It means a great chant for deliverance. 1966, I had gone to San Francisco. I had heard that the devotees had recorded a, a, a record at that time. I had also heard that the Beatles had ordered 300 copies of that. LP, 33 and the third LP vinyl recording. And it was the kind of thing where it just sort of passed that, okay, the Beatles got 300 copies. So after, after about a week, we just sort of forgot about it. But I found out later that uh, George had gotten that record himself and that he and John had chanted that Hare Krishna mantra in the, in, while sailing somewhere in the Mediterranean Sea. So for so long that he said that his jaws were aching. I, I think that Chanting helped George a lot overcome feelings of distress and anger. He once said to me, George once said that, that once you start chanting, you don't want to stop. I think that he was very attached to the chanting and also to, to uh, people like myself who are of his age and who were on a spiritual path. Sometimes I called him a closet Krishna because he didn't shave his head, he didn't wear clothes. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. You know, he was very enthusiastic and he wanted to give back. He wanted spiritual life to be something practical, not theoretical or abstract. So he, I remember him coming to the temple in London and saying, you know, hey lads, let's, let's, let's record this mantra. I can see it now, the first Sanskrit tune on the top 10. And it actually did, it went to the top 10 across Europe and uh, worked its way into the rock musical hair, 
became part of the zeitgeist of, of the era. And uh, that's a Sanskrit term. <laughs> and uh, here it is. And here's here. This is, all right, I had to throw this in. I don't know, my wife Esther's in the back. I don't know if she likes me showing this or not. That's me with my hands up in the back behind George. Uh, ah, those were the days. But it did. Photoshop. Photoshop. <laughs> Um, it's great to be spiritual, but you shouldn't neglect your family and friends, and that's kind of what happened at one point. Uh, you can see George's wife, Patty, here, literally in the background <laughs> at this point to his spiritual practices. Um, you know, don't, don't get so spiritual that your family wants to push you down a flight of stairs. <laughs> you know, hey, what happened to Susie? What happened to Johnny? You know, um, so Patty was feeling sidelined, and she ended up going with their friend Eric Clapton, which inspired this next song, lovely number by Eric, to uh, honor his, his lady love. <laughs> and I don't know. Got me on my knees 
so much. So, um, here's a picture of George and uh, Eric together. Uh, you know, it's funny, I, I spoke with the lawyer. Uh, you get a little of the Beatles trivia stuff going in here, you know, you pick up on that. I, one of the people I interviewed for the biography on sale at Reasonably Priced at the back of the uh, was the, the lawyer in London who handled George and Patty's divorce. He said he wished all divorces were as amicable as the one they went through. He said he'd never experienced two people really caring for each other. And so I think the thing was there's a, there's a right way and a wrong way to do everything. And, uh, you know, even if people have to separate, and there's a way to do that compassionately. And apparently that's, that's how it happened. Um, another song from a great Abbey Road album. This song is either about Patty or it's about Krishna, depending on no, who George. No, no, no. What? Something. No, no. Oh, here comes the sun. Ah. Ah. <laughs> My notes are all. Um, yeah, so what happened was the Beatles were going through this kind of divorce. <laughs> And uh, at one point, George says, I've had enough. And he splits from Twickenham Studio, I think it was, right? And uh, he just, he left. He left the Beatles. And he went to his friend Eric's home. And uh, it was kind of a warm day. It was a nice day. You George know? was kind of a half gla glass, half full kind of guy. So in the midst of all of these breakups, you know, his wife and the Beatles and he comes up with this song. And it's the most, it's this lovely thing that's kind of the signature George Harrison song. He, he kind of grabbed hold of one of Eric's uh, big giant acoustic guitars, um, the Zemitis brand, uh, and, and they named it uh, Ivan the Terrible. This guitar had a nickname. And George borrowed it and went out into uh, Eric's back garden and just walked around and wrote this song. <laughs> it sounds something like this. Here comes the sun. It's alright 
This song as well. Um, we were at the London Temple when George called and said, you know, can you guys come out to my home? I want to play something for you. <laughs> Came and I picked up a acoustic guitar and he played this thing. It just knocked us out. Just floored us. This beautiful piece. And um, he... Uh, <laughs> We asked him, you know, who's it about? He says, well, I had to say something in the way he moves, something the way she moves, because uh, if I said he, people might have some questions about my orientation. But uh, so when he was talking with Patty, he was about her. When he was talking with us, it was about God, and it was about Krishna. Um, so I guess it depended on the mood of the day. And the video, I remember the video for the song, they filmed it uh, not in Sittenhurst, at Lennon's estate there, where they were all taking that last photo shoot. Yeah. And they were all walking around with their wives or, or whatever, so they wanted to keep it on the... Well, it was politic, I think. Yes. Yeah. Don't want to alienate anybody. No, no, no. Um, so, uh, one of my favorites. Frank Sinatra said it was one of the greatest love songs ever written. He also said one of the greatest Lennon and McCartney songs. <laughs> and he attributed it to Lennon and McCartney. What are you going to do? Okay. Uh, this is going to feature Mike also on lead guitar. Okay. Mm -hmm.
dissolved, it took a little while, somewhere between 1970 and 1973, depending on how you legally define dissolution, uh, the Beatles did dissolve. The, um, the British press said it was akin to the dissolution of the British Empire. Whether it was that bad or not, I don't know. But um, people were very sad. Um, George, however, finally gets to cut loose. Having been restrained by the Lennon-McCartney dynamo of songwriting, he had all of these songs that he had stored up that he had written but never had a chance to, to perform or to publish. So he comes out, his first foray into a solo career is historic. It's the first three records set in rock history, All Things Must Pass, goes to the top of the charts, and uh, he's earned his freedom. He's finally getting a chance to put into practice the spiritual lessons uh, and the desire to make a difference in the world. The following year, in 1971, his friend Ravi Shankar approaches him and asks him to help raise some money for the victims of Bangladesh, the war that was going on there. And um, Ravi thought they might be able to raise 20 or $30,000. George says, no, I think we can do better. So he calls around to all of his rock and roll friends and puts together the first charity rock concert in history in Madison Square Garden, raised somewhere in the order of $11 million from the concert, from the film, the music rights, and so on. And here's a memorable song from that uh, concert for Bangladesh. Not only does this song include the the Krishna mantra. Oh, you want to see it? All right, you got to see this. It's four minutes long. It's so good. Really nice. It's this. This. It's George and friends talking about uh, the background to my sweet Lord. Uh, the first guy you're going to hear from is um, who is the record producer with Wall of Sound? Phil Spector. Phil Spector is the first person you're talking about. Why he chose. Um, um, my Sweet Lord to be the, the featured song on this album, and then you'll hear from uh, Billy Preston and others. So here, here's this little clip that we found. I think My Sweet Lord of all the songs, because I told them that's, that's the hit. And everybody fought me on that because they said it's a religious overtones in it. I just said it didn't matter. It's the most commercial song in it. And George was even nervous about it because the Hare Krishna in it, and my sweet Lord, and was the public ready for that? I said, doesn't matter, it's a hit record. I thought a lot about whether to do my sweet Lord or not, having written it. I thought, it's really committing myself to something. There's going to be a lot of people are going to get really hate me because people fear the unknown, you see. It's some sort of instinct in people. The point was that I was sticking my neck out on the chopping block. But at the same time, I thought, well, nobody's the same. You know, it would be, I wish somebody else was doing it, so that, uh, you know, to represent, you know, because everything should be represented in a way. And if everybody's just going to be Bob Baby, you know, okay. We were on tour with Bonnie and Delaney. They came over to England, and, and George was a big fan. And one, one place we were, we had a piano in the dressing room. And uh, the discussion was, how do you write a gospel song? So I went to the piano and started playing some gospel chain up. And I don't know if it was me or Bonnie, but one of them started, oh, my Lord. And then they went on. We said, hallelujah. Repetition 
You know, really, I think um, the thing about a mantra, you see, it's got a mantra in there, and uh, mantras are, well, the, they call it a mystical sound vibration encased in a syllable. It has this power within it, and you know, it's just hypnotic, and it's kind of nice, you know, it's nice, I mean, I've had done that mantra for ages, once I chanted it for like three days non-stop, just driving through Europe, and you just get like hypnotized, you get a, on some subtle level, which makes you feel so good that you don't want to stop. <laughs>
So this this particular prayer or mantra at the end, where they're repeating all those yeah. um, names of God or whatever, are, it's is is that like um like a um, a prayer to the guru or something? It's or? A, it's a prayer to the guru. It says the guru is as good as God. That that the one who imparts the teachings of spiritual life of a holy life. Should be honored as the as God's emissary. We were. Um, I was in India with uh, Alan Parsons' live project years ago, and we played a festival in Mumbai called the One Tree Festival, and it was Alan Parsons' project and Buddy Guy and a few other acts that were <laughs> kind of a weird festival. But anyway, we, it was an outdoor thing, and on the side of the stage during the day, they had like an altar set up. And there were some priests, whatever, uh, you know, that were chanting that. Mm -hmm. Those those names of God that you hear at the end of My Sweet Lord. And I was standing there with John Montagna, who is, uh, you know, a, a real Beatle fanatic, you know, freak. And, I, and I'm standing there with him, and I just said to him, does that sound familiar to you? And he's going. I don't know, I don't know. And of course, they're repeating it over and over again. So I'm going, give it another listen. See if it, see if it comes to you. <laughs> Did you get it? Uh, no, he didn't get it. And I just said, that's the end of My Sweet Lord. <laughs> that, that, what they're singing. I think. Yeah. And he went, get out of here. How do you know that? Yeah, how do you imagine, you know, the chutzpah, as they say in Sanskrit, to take, <laughs> to take a Sanskrit mantra and, 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 you know, put it in a pop song. I mean, but this is what George was doing. He's putting any for everything on the line. You know, he risked his fame. He risked his wealth. He risked his credibility. He risked his standing in the music industry. Ultimately, he risked his health, his family, and his friends. He risked alienation from his fans. But you know what? For the first time in a lot of our lives, that was the first time we heard that. Mantra. That's the point. Uh, by doing that, he gave those of us who were kind of on the edge of spiritual practice, the encouragement to actually go the distance. And here you'll see that's what's happening at this stage is introducing, he's honing his skills and he's introducing these spiritual ideas almost between the lines. For example, in the next song that you're gonna hear, you'll see that by staining the words, oh my Lord, oh my, by stringing that out for about 12 bars, he creates the pranav om kara mantra the primal creative sound reputed to have set the universe in motion at, at the dawn of time so here's that song give me love the opening track from 1973 album living in the material world yes indeed Thank you. 
Just very quickly, I, I, want, I put these three lines together because I wanted to give you an idea of what an extraordinary skill George had at condensing some very complex, sophisticated spiritual ideas into singable lyrics. From that same song, Keep Me Free From Birth, is a paraphrasing of the fourth chapter of Bhagavad Gita, where the speaker, Sri Krishna, says, one who knows me does not take birth again. From I, Me, and Mine, the 1970 Let It Be album, uh, I, Me, Mine, the kind of, where does that come from? It's in the fifth canto of the Bhagavad Purana, where we read, one increases life's illusions by thinking in terms of I, me, and mine. And then uh, from, uh, the, uh, from living in the material world, use my body like a car, taking me both near and far. Where did that idea come from? 18th chapter of Bhagavad Gita, seated as if, the soul is seated as if on a machine made of matter, made of the material energy. So here's this guy, he's able to take these complex ideas and create these very singable, you know, lovely songs. Um, you see the beads that he's wearing, these neck beads. Uh, it, when you see Krishna devotees wearing uh, one strand of these beads made of tulsi wood, a sacred bush from India, it, it means they're um, a candidate for initiation into bhakti or devotional practice. If they wear, th wear three strands, I have three strands because I was initiated, that means they've received formal diksha or initiation from a guru, a teacher. If you look at George, he's wearing two strands. He's kind of keeping his options open a little bit here. That's my take on it. Um, that okay, but he got starting a little aggressive sometimes in his preaching. You know, people didn't want uh, preacher George, they wanted Beatle George. And uh, it kind of came back to haunt him on his next album, uh, the Dark Horse album, where um, he saw himself as an outsider now to the rock and roll world, a dark horse, if you will. Uh, and so in December of 1974, this album came out. The title song here um, got some poor reviews. Uh, and um, he took it to heart. Um, he went into um, kind of a depression about it. Here you can see him on stage. I mean, he's encouraging everyone to chant. chant. At one point, he was carrying a poster of Krishna on stage, you know, and saying, listen, someone's got to tell you, you know, and, uh, he, that kind of frustration of really wanting people to get it, you know, don't you get it, you know, you're not your body, you're eternal. We saw this show, friends of mine and, and I yeah. went to see this tour in 1974 yeah. at Madison Square Garden, and they did a s similar thing, doing an afternoon show and then an evening show, just like they did at Bangladesh, yeah. you know, they do that as well. I think we were at the afternoon show, and it got a lot of bad reviews because his voice was shot for the tour, and he... Yeah, they started calling it the Dark Horse Tour. Dark Horse Tour. Horse, like, <coughs> horse, like I'm, you know. And George just said, what am I supposed to do? Like, put all these people out of work for the whole summer, you know, because you got a couple of hundred people on a crew yeah. that are all depending upon that tour and that work. He just went on and soldiered on with it. And we read the reviews afterwards, and we were like, we don't care. We, could, we saw George. We saw thing, Beatle you know, live, you know. Fans didn't care what the reviewers said. He had so. a blast, you know, so. Uh, but George, you know, look, here's a guy, his whole life, he was loved by the world. I mean, it was Beatle George. There wasn't, I mean, every place he goes, people were screaming in love. But, so and now, all of a sudden, he's getting some bad reviews, and he took it to heart. He went into a kind of depression withdrew to his home in Friar. <laughs> Someone said to me, if you're gonna be in a depression, that's a nice place to do it. Um, what are their rates? And then uh, John's murder, of course, in December of 1980, sent him further into a depression, and further into retreat. I mean, here are these guys, they just wanted to put a good message out into the world, and this is the way the world responds, you know, by killing him. So he took time off, and um, he found something amazing um, that with a little bit of time off, the bitterness went away and he enjoyed things that being on the road never allowed him to do, a family, having a son, uh, um, a, a, a gardener. He was the most miraculous gardener. I got to visit Friar Park and, and, and saw what it was like there. It was absolutely extraordinary what he had done. There he had a lot to be grateful for 
And um, he even permitted himself to form a new band with a bunch of real amateurs. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Jeff Lynn, Roy Everson, Tom Petty, Bob Dylan, the Traveling Wilburys. Shall we, um, shall we give the folks Jim Keltner on drums? Jim Keltner on drums. You got a, you got a Wilbury number you want to do? Sure, sure. Well, I knew you did, but I had to ask. Okay. And even though George was the gardener, uh, you wouldn't know that there was a human hand in there. It's like nature had just done her thing. It was really beautiful to see it. Then um, he was out gardening one day and he felt a lump. And 
was diagnosed with cancer. He wasn't bitter about that either. He was ready to move on. He said at one point, I don't care about records, I don't care about films or about being on television or all that stuff, because in my eyes, that's for people who don't know where they're going. And you know what they say, if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. Well, that would have been a perfect segue. It you. would have been a perfect segue. Too. We don't do that. Francis. That was a, a line from Brainwash, the posthumous album. Here's another um, little video clip that explains, George explains a little bit in his own words where he was at in those days. say something, I'd like it to have some kind of importance, some value, so that, you know, in 20 years' time, it's still, it's not just some dumb song that made, you know, some royalties. I mean, the royalties are nice, but it would be good to be able to have something a little deeper. George, wherever you are, we send you 
our love and we send you our thanks for being the wonderful person you are and for taking the journey with such seriousness of purpose and mature, sober judgment and, <laughs> and reminding us to have a good time as we pursue the salvation of our souls. So, God, we a special thanks to you as well for keeping our tribute on the spiritual foundation here for the past 17 years. And so, uh, and this incredible band, amazing guys. Um, our thanks as well to the to the Tony Awards. Five years ago, this wonderful trophy for best tribute concert of the year. Yeah, no, best tribute, best tribute performed in Brooklyn on a Saturday <laughs> between the hours of 6 and 10 p.m. About a formal beetle on the south side of Skimmerhorn Street. We're very, very proud. It be. Uh, we're also available for weddings and bar mitzvahs. And, um, Sweet 16 listen, parties. I'm going to be at the book table. Should we ask these guys if they sing a few more songs just to come? Like that? Okay, it's all yours, guys. I'll see you in the back. Joshua Green, everyone. So, um, this this next song wound up becoming a, one of my favorites to do in my when I used to do acoustic solo shows and then started doing acoustic duo shows with Mike over there. Uh, and um, I used to like to tell the story, and Mike likes to finish it for me, right? Please. <laughs> <laughs> so I talk about, you know, my, my early childhood and being a, a Beatle fan. Uh, in, back in 1964, I was going to um, a day camp. CYO day camp. CYO day camp, correct, up in um, Whitestone. Whitestone. <laughs> I was eight years old. I was eight years old at the time. And I can totally remember. And I can totally remember sitting in the back of the bus going up to the day camp with the girl Girls. counselors <laughs> singing Beatles songs with them. Um, and I can totally remember singing this song right here. So please sing along, everyone, as well, okay? You'll never know how much I really love you. You'll never know how much I really care Listen Just like Paul McCartney's. <laughs> it was. But 
I never knew that was a George song. I always thought it was right. John Lennon. It was the first time I heard George singing the lead on one of those songs. I didn't even realize it wasn't John or Paul, you know, at the time, which probably a lot of us didn't even realize as well. Yeah. But um, what do we got next? Oh, yeah. We're just going to keep you entertained for a few more minutes, if you don't mind. It is uh, Saturday night, by the way.
a switch for the songs. It's, it ain't easy, folks. <laughs> Show business, you know what I mean? These guitars, though. So they are, they are some of the best looking guitars you in, get to see the back of in Glendale and Middle Village. Look at the back of this thing. It's unbelievable. I got that from my dentist, you know. Doesn't Coyote run into this? Doesn't Coyote run into this? Looney Tunes? Is this a
it is a, an extraordinary honor and privilege for me to get to work with my, uh, I used a lot of words, I don't want to go there. This friend will form. She was a good guy, he's a good guy, right? You. 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 Um, you. You. Um, you got a gift. Just, <laughs> just honored uh, and privileged to be able to do this service. Uh, and uh, the fact that I was fortunate enough to be born in a time when uh, this movement was happening and George Harrison was on the planet and all that, it all just lined up. Uh, and to just be friends with Joshua for many years now and to be get to, to do this service together with him and to engage all these other guys that are amazing musicians and really nice guys, lots of fun to hang out with and rehearse with. We have such a great time. The Godfrey Townsend. Joe DeJesu, Michael also, Rich Zucker, Eddie Prophet Jr., please join me. Oh 